Hey there everyone, it's AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views with multiple uploads every week to help share the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of D&D. Troglodytes. Relatively simple reptilian thugs encountered usually underground that smell really bad. They tend to murder most mammalian humanoids that they encounter. Easy. Could cover that in a 5 minute video, right? Well. Settle back and grab a beverage my friend, this is the Mighty Glue Stick. It's time to get deeply nerdy. And by the way, I hope you've eaten your dinner already because this video contains some descriptions of olfactory senses which you may find unpleasant. In the game's history, troglodytes have been with us since the first edition of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons in 1977 and have been in every subsequent edition, as well as a lot of the popular adventure modules published over the years such as The Cult of the Reptile God, The Lost Caverns of Sojanth, The Isle of Dread and another 26 adventures. So quite an extensive presence, not just in the original D&D for Greyhawk, but in all of the settings including Eberron where they are descended from dragons and inhabit ancient ruins dating from the Age of Demons deep below the jungles of Quibara, despised by all, even the other reptilian races. Little is known about the history of the troglodytes there, but on the world of Toril, we have a substantial body of information to delve into. Also, just as a note on the artwork found in this video, there is, as you will see, a lot of variation. Some of the images look more like lizard folk, some are more like crocodiles, some are like dinosaurs, some are very stocky and look like savage dragonborn. Well, the species like this, living in isolated tribes, facing tens of thousands of years of hostile changing environments, it would be more unusual if they looked very similar to each other. So there is a lot of variation in troglodyte appearance and a little bit of variation in behaviour, but a lot of their basic behaviours and traits have remained the same since the very beginning. Troglodytes have proven to be supreme survivors, as we shall learn. In order to understand the troglodytes, we have to go back in time. 37,000 years ago, the end of the Great Glaciation uh, and the retreat of the waters to the Age of Thunder and the era of the Creator races. It was almost like a different world entirely. The sun was brand new, actually literally brand new, shining down on a tropical and temperate world with massive supercontinent called Boros. It was marshy and covered in stagnant lakes, teeming with insects and riotous growths of fungus, fungi, moss, algae, mats, ferns, and the beginnings of, prim of primitive uh, plant life. From out of the oceans, creatures bred as the servitors and warriors of horrible aquatic masters escaped their captivity and crawled out of the muddy shores onto the land. Among them were the amphibious creatures that would evolve into the Batrachi, and the unintelligent reptiles that would spread across the land, known as thunderers, they would come to rule this land, the sea and the sky. A thousand years later, the primitive bands of hunter-gatherer lizard folk lived among the fertile bay of what would one day be called Durpa. Uh, from these advanced reptiles emerged the Saruk, and the cliff-dwelling reptiles went from gliders to soaring titans and eventually the first birds who would become the Airy. And their fertile valleys left behind in the waters as they drained uh, away, tending to the young forests were the Sylvans, wanderers between the Feywild and the world. These were the creator races, and I'll be bringing you a lot more information on them in the meantime. For now, we can turn our attention to the Saruk, also known as the Sauroids, or creators of the serpent folk and scaly kind. The Saruk, Batrachi and Eriri, each dominated Faerun in turn, creating and producing as offspring a host of lesser races and recording the magic of more of their primitive peoples, the origin of the legendary Nether Scrolls. It was their mastery of magic in the earliest days that saw the Saruk grow to early dominance over the world, with a massive empire stretching for thousands of miles. Only a rare few Saruk still lurk, still lurk, in ancient ruins and southern jungles today since most of their kindred departed for other planes millennia ago. What became of them is not what we're looking at today though, it is their creations that concern us. The Saruk progressed from hunters to farmers of livestock, and their empire grew along with their technology. They dominated every race they encountered and only regarded other reptilian races as anything better than vermin and food. During this time, they absorbed other more primitive cousin species and enslaved them completely, breeding them for specific tasks, much like humans breed dogs and horses. One of those races was to become the troglodytes. The original troglodytes were bred from a species found along what would one day be known as the Cholton Peninsula. This was colonised by the second Saruk realm, called Mersholk. 
It was this empire that also created the Nagas, Terra Folk and Yuan Ti. Sewer workers, herders of the waste eaters, bred to flush the vermin out of the caves, troglodytes were always adept at living in darkness and hunting down the mammal races that hid away in such places. Remember, the serpent folk considered the mammals to be vermin. By 3000 at minus 3200 DR, the Sarok had conquered so many races that they became the minority of their own empire. The century of civil strife drove the Saruk of the Okoth Empire to depart to the outer planes of existence where they discovered uh, that, that they had discovered through magic, collapsing their empire in minus 3, 4, 100 DR, leaving their slaves behind in the chaos of their sudden departure. Over the next few hundred years, the Yuanti rose up to take control of much of the lands of their absent masters, but they did not find much acceptance for the other former slaves, particularly the most intelligent, the most hardy, and the most savage. The Naga were spread far and wide across the world. Lizard folk simply refused to follow orders, and the troglodytes had become completely feral. A, mutant, uh, a mutual hatred and a lack of communication between them and the other scaly kind, which was once kept in check by the masters, was now the wedge that would never see their empire return to its former glory, paving the way for the rise of the amphibian Batrachi eventually. The troglodytes spread across the world, retreating into remote areas, cavern complexes and deep under the surface, into the harsh underdark. Wherever they encountered the scaleless ones, particularly mammals, the, the hatred bred into them caused an eruption of savage violence, and that breeding has stayed true for most of them to this day. Dragon Magazine number 235 has an interesting monster ecology article for the troglodytes. Though it's more of a story, it does give a superb insight into the perceptual and language differences between trogs and mammalian humanoids. In this article written by Spike Wire Jones, we learn that troglodytes have an exceptional sense of smell and rely on it more than they do their visual sense, which is almost entirely devoted to their dark vision, or in their case, infravision a means of seeing in completely lightless conditions by detecting tiny differences in temperature, thermovision. Trogs are so reliant on smell that it forms a large part of their own unique language. And the only reason they share a lot of the verbal traits of lizard folk is that they originally needed a means to communicate with other members of scaly kind who could not sense and produce odors like they can. And that is the main reason why trogs smell so bad. It has nothing to do, uh, it's nothing more than them talking to each other, but it explains so much more about their habitat and behavior. They do not ri rely on visual landmarks and they've never recognized the point of written language. They have none of their own and do not learn to read. They don't use maps. Instead, they navigate by olfactory descriptions given to them by other troglodytes. And at least half of all of their words are smells not sounds, which means they are very hard to talk to aside from very basic verbal meanings. It also means they're extremely difficult to emulate, which greatly increased their ability to survive when the Batrachi amphibians waged wars using doppelgangers to infiltrate and destroy the reptilians. But more on that later. They pay as much attention to their sight as we do to our hearing, so being blinded is not much of an inconvenience to them. But flooding an area with fragrant smoke and heat, such as piles of burning herbs, will drive them away as it completely overwhelms their senses. They avoid flame as it is blinding to them, so they never mastered the art of metal smithing and they never cook meat. They have a high degree of tolerance for the sort of bacteria and rancid food and rotting meat, and their fine appreciation for the smells and textures of things extends itself to a culinary practice that is truly loathsome to most other races. In fact, they tend to attract uh, otugs and oozes, carrion crawlers and myconids such as much like agrarian humanoids attract birds, rats and cats to the abundance of grains. The warrens and tunnels, caves, ca caverns, ruins and sewers they inhabit are everywhere. They have existed on the world for thousands and thousands of years, often right under the noses of great civilization which have risen and fallen. All the while they've remained relatively unchanged, arranging their lairs so that the wind always blows inward from the entrance so that they can communicate alarm by bursts of smell. A signal from a sentry guard will travel 20 feet per round silently alerting others up to a range of about 80 feet but this scent is released by other trogs as they detect it and relay it along. Troglodytes don't change their environment much but will dig new tunnels and collapse walls in order to improve the flow of air for this very reason. Of course humanoids caught in close confines with trogs are at the mercy of this cloud of stench reflected in the most famous problems one's facing when they're fighting them. 
Physically, most troglodytes stand about 5 feet tall and weigh an average of 150 pounds or 68 kilograms. And they have a long tail and their arms are much longer than their legs. Most have quite an overdeveloped jaw compared to the lizard folk and they have a distinctive spiked crest and horn-like growths from the back of the skull to uh, protect them from things attacking them from behind. In the monster manual for 5th edition it tells us that they have a habit of marking their territory with pictographs painted in blood or dung. This is a misconception. The smears themselves don't have any particular meaning to the trogs. It's the actual smell of blood or dung which has the meaning for them and other troglodytes. It says they dwell in filth. The walls of their cavern homes are smeared with grime, oily secretions and the debris, uh, debris of foul feasting. Revolting, rotting smears on surfaces are the equivalent for them of wallpaper and tapestries. They carry a wealth of meaning to the troglodytes that's entirely lost on other races. If scholars cared to really study these lair layers, they would see that the trogs collect ipsons because of the way they smell, and the smears and muck are accented by fine inlays of other stinky objects, secretions, and so on, painting a picture for the nostrils of the trogs. They do not cook or preserve their food, so the whole community spends most of their time going out on raids for meat. And they love to eat humans and halflings more than anything else. They even use the smell of human as an adjective in their language for something delicious or intoxicatingly good. <laughs> the largest and toughest troglodytes lead the hunt and become the leaders of their tribes. They can easily be spotted because they are the ones who have the most items on them that are made of metal. And they can only get this material through violence as they have nothing to trade with other races. So owning a metal uh, item is a sign of strength and experience. It plays a part in their mating habits as well which are best described as primitive, violent, and simplistic, some would even say savage. Troglodytes are cannibalistic, so they eat their own dead. They eat those too injured to provide and hunt and protect themselves and the tribe. They also would eat the eggs laid by females if they knew for sure that they were not their own offspring. So the females tend to confuse the issue of parentage and also lay the eggs uh, and protect them communi communally by necessity. The juveniles are fast and wary. They don't get up and walk in a bipedal stance until they're old enough to defend themselves. And standing at full height is a threat display between troglodytes, as is a deep hissing inhale of breath. And of course, a riot of loud odours. In combat, trogs smell the enemies who are releasing the strongest smell of fear. They interpret this as being the weakest and most vulnerable, so always attack them first. They are not depicted in the Monster Manual as using weapons, but this again is not accurate. They are very adept at throwing uh, primitively made but expertly thrown spears, usually tipped with chipped stone points or the broken off tips of daggers or recycled metal spear tips scavenged from other races. They are also quite good at throwing stones and dropping large stones on top of their prey, or anything that seeks to invade their warrens. Underground, they are very quiet and hard to spot as they tend to blend in with their surroundings, giving them a plus two and advantage on stealth rolls. While in direct sunlight, the troglodyte has disadvantage on attack rolls as well as uh, on wisdom perception checks that rely on sight. The more, um, their stench is infamous, and any creature other than a gargoyle that starts us uh, other other than a troglodyte gargoyle that starts its turn within five feet of the troglodyte must succeed on a DC 12 Constitution saving throw or be poisoned until the start until the start of the creature's next turn. On a successful saving throw, the creature is immune to the stench of troglodytes for one hour. A particularly nasty DM is quite free to say that sure. Your character is immune to the troglodyte stench for the next hour, but the pool of rotting corpses, the half-eaten ox with the slime, slime bubbling away with acidic sizzles in the depths of its bloated entrails, the character's not immune to those horrific odors just yet. If your description of the scene inside a troglodyte lair has not caused at least one of your players to say, oh god no, at least once, you're doing it wrong. Their caves are carpeted in beetles and maggots. Their air is buzzing with fat, hairy flies. The walls are slick with putrid goo. The trogs themselves are constantly pluming off clouds of skunk spray levels of stank. The player characters should be loath to search the place for treasure, because honestly the environment is much, much more likely to give them diseases and infections than any sort of loot that, that is worth the mental trauma of going through that disgusting hive. As it says, their dark vision range is 60 feet. Well, their other senses comp uh, compensate completely for their lack 
of uh, visual range. So certainly remember that they can smell approaching creatures from at least 180 feet away if they are downwind, which means if your character is entering their lair, the flow of air will carry the character's scent right to the trogs, around corners, up or down shafts to other levels. So the best way to get the drop on them is to catch them when they are out hunting and attack them when you're upwind, uh, when they're upwind of the characters. In sunlight, they have disadvantage on attack rolls that rely on sight. So throwing rocks and spears, sure. But when they're in melee range of a victim, they're not relying on sight. They're relying on smell. And they do not attack with disadvantage, even in bright sunlight. Trogs are not that powerful powerful individually. Their armor class of 11 and 13 hit points, meh. But they are plus 4 to hit and they get 3 attacks per round. And they always attack in groups. So use the mob combat rules in Dungeon Master's Guide on page 250. Absolutely, absolutely learn that simple rule and it will make your task so much easier, believe me. But some other creatures uh, that you can put into the mix increase the challenge such as a few Gricks, an Otug, maybe even an Etikap, and certainly add larger, more powerful tribal champions with some more hit points, a slightly better to hit bonus, and a couple more points of damage. Even something like a status symbol weapon, such as a metal uh, studded great club, which will make a big difference when you use those mob combat rules and save your son, yourself a ton of dice rolls. Troglodytes have always seen humans, halflings, elves, goblins and others as little more than nothing more than threats and food. They can be found almost everywhere but are most common in the upper underdark, underground ruins and old sewers. They travel and hunt mostly at night and do not see any value in gold, gems or other objects that have no practical value to them, although they do love shiny objects for some reason. They don't read and they don't speak any language other than their own and they have no real concept of trade, friendship, alliance, peace or mercy. On the upside, they also see no point in torture. So if you've captured by them, one can expect a relatively quick death before being roughly chopped apart and gradually eaten over the next few weeks. Perhaps with the cracked skull of the character showing up on a branch shoved into the ground, marking the edge of the territory smeared with skunk glands and rotten blood. They do have a god named Laegzed. His symbol is an oozing lizard toad, and he provides no benefits to the trogs at all. I'm not sure why they or how they worship him, really. Uh, in other worlds, they have other other um, other gods. Those of you who are watching this on your mobile phone right this minute, take a second to move your thumb and tap the like icon. Thank you kindly. If you're not subscribed already, it is well worth it, as I have over 250 monster ecology videos like this one for you to watch at your leisure, and more of them every week. Those who wish to explore the description text under the video, you will see links to my Patreon page, where you can get access to all of these scripts for these videos which have all the names and locations and references collected in them, as well as having special access to me. And I will research things for my patrons, answer any questions, and even make the occasional video on subjects they request from me. Anyone who can join the Mighty Glustic Discord server, great platform to chat, create game groups, run video chat games with people around the world, share dank memes, and discuss all things D&D. Link down below, as well as links to merchandise for the channel, plus Patron Blades. I highly recommend Patron Blades, as I use them myself for a mighty smooth shave as always thanks for listening and i'll be back with more for you very soon